Welcome, Mark Caban. He's going to tell, tell us about how he's empowering uh, young children who are new in this country to get them, you know, accustomed to the culture and help them with their grades. And he's using soccer to, to help these kids. Okay, guys. Um, so today, obviously, I'm coming here to talk about my life's work and uh, what I'm doing with my life. And it's really intertwined with my personal narrative, which is why I decided to come here today and kind of tell you about um, my life story. Um, it started in 1974, before I was even born, um, when my parents got married. Uh, a year later, um, the civil war in our country in Beirut officially started. Um, it was a really bad war that lasted for 15 years and claimed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. It left a really bad legacy of loss, and my family did not escape that legacy either. Um, one day, uh, my uh, uncle, my mother's brother, was um, uh, murdered along with uh, my cousin and his wife, and uh, that really scared my family and, uh, and you know, was the catalyst of getting out of the country. Um, so I was one of the first people in my family born in the United States. This is me in Connecticut, and a uh, little baby here. Um, I actually still remember this day. I was terrified. I felt like I was drowning in the snow. And uh, sooner than later, um, the Civil War in my country had ended. So when I was in preschool still, we headed back to Beirut. And this is my passport right here. And this is my, day, my place of birth is Connecticut. Um, and every time I go through customs, they still have a really tough time um, pronouncing that state. Um, this is me living here in my country. Um, I lived there for four years. And uh, it was really great. Um, I didn't really know that there was a 15-year civil war that just ended when I went back. I remember as a kid, you know, you have these memories that stay with you, but you don't really know why they stay with you. But um, I, I remember going through Beirut and seeing buildings with uh, bullet holes all in them, um, with huge, um, like, tanks all over the place, with soldiers. And for me, it was just, it was normal. I, I mean, I, I kind of think that I had a pretty good childhood there. I was really happy. Um, this is me in my neighborhood. It's called Burj Hamoud. I lived in an Armenian neighborhood um, where a lot of Armenians fled from the, um, from, the, from the genocide that they escaped as well. And um, we didn't really have any parks in my neighborhood, um, but we definitely had a lot of back alleys. We had a lot of neighborhood kids. And uh, there wasn't a lot of sports teams or organized sports to be a part of because I think that uh, 15 years of a civil war kind of um, creates... Uh, a generation of kids who missed out on playing and having a normalcy in their childhood. Um, but when I did get to play, um, it usually would end when a soccer ball uh, would get uh, popped in the middle of my game. I, th I think this is an old, the older slide that I was supposed to be using, but I'm going to keep, keep going with it. Um, the next thing that I knew it actually, my family was going to, uh, we were going to be on the run, we were going to be on the go once again, and we decided to leave Lebanon. Uh, this time around, we left because, um, not because of war, but of finances. I had three older siblings that were going to go to college, and we couldn't afford to do so. So we ended up uh, moving to the United States, and, and uh, San Diego, California would be my new home. Uh, in the first week that I was there, because there was such a big time difference, I would wake up with my brother at like 2 in the morning every day. And just like we did in Lebanon, we'd get up, and we'd just go around our neighborhood exploring around. And on one of those early morning walks, we discovered a neighborhood park, which is probably the first time I've ever seen one in my life. And uh, on the way to the park, I just remember seeing all the houses, how perfect they were. There were stop signs. There was no bullet holes in the buildings and all these things. So I was really amazed by everything. Um, so me and my brother, we, we pretty much spent every single moment of our spare time in these parks, playing, growing. Um, and it was really great memories for me. Uh, on the other hand, when I was uh, a newcomer here, uh, you know, I didn't fit in. I didn't have the nice clothes. Uh, I was different. I spoke a different language. People didn't really understand me, so I got picked on a lot. Um, and it really didn't help that I looked like a little girl, too. I got picked on a lot for that. Um, but, <laughs> but one part that I discovered about myself is that I was a pretty good athlete. Um, in Lebanon, I guess I was the fastest kid. I remember that, but I never got a chance to... Um, prove myself. So I started playing uh, American football, which my mom really wasn't happy about. 
Um, we got some scars right here that she told me, I told you so. And uh, eventually, though, playing football led me to a college scholarship. Um, that's me in the air, catching a, catching a ball. And um, I was uh, really excited to get the scholarship to Kansas. I went out to the middle of nowhere, and I was really happy about what I was doing. And in 2006, when I was getting ready for my junior year, um, my country got invaded again. Um, this time it was a conflict with our neighbors, uh, with Israel. And uh, in one summer, our country was destroyed. All of our bridges were blown up. Um, there were several thousand people that were murdered in the war, mostly children. And uh, it was really the first time in my life where I felt like what I was doing was really frivolous, you know. <laughs> it was a really tough time for me. Um, we, <laughs> we didn't let my mom watch the news anymore because it was just going to give her a heart attack. Um, so after the season, I went up to my coach and said, hey, coach, um, I'm going to go to Lebanon to study abroad. I really feel like I need to be there. And he told me, he gave me a big smile and said, no way. Um, take a fifth year and then you can go do that at that time. So I said, I gave him a smile and said, okay, yes, coach. Um, I went home for winter break and uh, another coach called me up bef um, two days before I was supposed to go back to Kansas. He said, you're coming back, right? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm coming back. I got my ticket and everything. So the next thing I knew it, um, I was back in, in Lebanon. Um, <laughs> so um, well, I was worried the whole time I was going to lose my scholarship, but at the same time, this is where I had to be because um, the guilt that I had was really overwhelming. And uh, when I got to Lebanon, I really saw that, you know, <clears throat> people overcome. You know, just like we overcame the 15-year war, that we're going to overcome this situation as well. And that really gave me a lot of hope. And it, it showed me that, you know what, it's one thing to be against a war or a peace activist, but there's so much to do afterwards. And that's really what inspired me to want to work with children and want to work um, with refugees of war. So after I graduated, um, I came back. Luckily, I got my scholarship, and uh, it was okay. So I was able to graduate, and uh, I wanted to um, go get my master's in refugee studies. So I applied to a university in, in Northern Africa in Egypt, and I got accepted. Um, and when I came home to San Diego before flying out, um, there were some family situations that had to make me stay. And then I also discovered that in the four years that I was gone um, away for college, that my hometown had become the largest city for permanent resettlement of refugees in the entire world. And over half of the refugees that come, come as children. So um, I was just really just shocked when, that, when I discovered that. I also discovered that over half of the refugees that were coming were from the part of the world that me and my family came from, the Arab world. Um, at this time, it was uh, from Iraq. And uh, it's, it's described as the, as the biggest refugee crisis since 1948 um, in Palestine with the Nakba. And um, so when I, when I first came back, I started working as a refugee case manager, which was a really great experience for me because I got the chance to um, get the insight with the families, learn about them, see what they're going through, and it was a really great experience for me. Um, like we talked about, you know, San Diego, when you first think about it, it's really not the typical place you think that is a, a place for refugees. You, you think about great weather, you think about uh, the beaches, and you think about the military tradition. Um, not a place for refugees of war to come and to seek uh, refuge. Um, so it kind of has a, has a contrast going on there. Um, but after I was working as a refugee case manager for a while, um, I decided that there was so much more to do um, with the kids especially, because when I, when I used to meet with them, I saw a little bit of myself in them. Obviously, that I came in a different situation. My family came here um, by choice, and the families that are coming here are coming because um, of death threats and um, other circumstances that made them flee. Um, but I could still see a lot of relation between the kids and, and myself. Uh, so what I did was I just gathered a group of people that I've known, and I told them about my initiative and what I wanted to do. Um, working with kids, get them out, um, playing sports. Because when I would go around seeing the families, um, they'd always be playing soccer. And that's the way that they, that they came together. And so I kind of wanted to meet them where they were. Um, this picture right here is uh, the picture of the first team that we ever put together. Um, we just put together, you know, several hundred dollars. And I went to speak at a school. Um, we weren't, I was 
we weren't really an organization yet, but I did a lot of pretending. And I went to the school and said, yes, we're this organization. We're coming here to do this. And I faked my way in. And it was really great. Um, at, at the beginning, I didn't really know that you needed field permits and you needed to do all these things. I just kind of showed up at a park and we started, we started practicing. Um, but the next thing we knew it, um, all these other kids started <laughs> wanting to show up, wanted to play soccer. And uh, turns out we were pretty good. Um, here's our kids right here winning uh, one of their tournaments this last summer. It's one of our under-19 teams uh, full of refugees from Iraq. Uh, they're Kurdish, they're Chaldean, Muslim, um, Afghan refugees as well in here. And uh, we're here winning the Crusader Cup, ironically, here last summer. And uh, this is him winning the, the game, the game-winning goal right here, uh, which is really great. A um, couple more pictures of here. The kids from all over Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. And uh, this year, you know, we're really focusing on a lot of, uh, on trying to get more girls into the program. Uh, like I said, back home, you know, we don't really have a lot of opportunities to play. And so, uh, especially not girls. So we're doing an extra outreach to reach out to the girls this year. And we're really excited about that initiative. So um, one of the things that uh, the refugees don't know when they're being resettled in San Diego is that the city that they're being resettled in is one of the most park poor communities um, in the whole county. It's called El Cajon. And uh, we really fought for the right to be in these parks. Um, it took us a seven month battle um, for me going to these city council meetings and really trying to advocate for this space that you would think, you know, I thought I was just gonna go and file a permit and that was gonna be the end, end of the story. But a couple thousand dollars later, seven months, uh, lots of headaches, um, we finally got our permits. Um, which was really great. Um, and I feel like it was um, the fear of the other. Um, people thought in our city that um, getting all the refugees together would be isolating them, um, making them resent the country that they were in. And um, it, it was just a lack of knowledge in our part. And so what we did was we brought our kids in to speak to the councils, to let them know what their life stories were. We got the police officers to come in and to advocate for our programs and, and other organizations like Survivors of Torture to come talk about the mental health that we were, uh, progress that we're making with the kids. Um, besides a safe place to play, um, refugees come here definitely embracing their inner nerd, you know? They definitely want to come here with immigrant mentality of, of uh, trying to go ahead and uh, get an engineering degree, become doctors, do these great, have these great goals. But a lot of the times, um, they get hit with a big wall of reality when they get here. Um, if they come here 16 years old and they don't speak the language, it's really tough for them. Um, a lot of the a lot of the kids are are diagnosed with post traumatic stress disorder, um, experiencing trauma in a new country. Their families are very stressed out. Um, they've been reduced to being an engineer or a doctor to coming here and being lucky enough to work at a gas station, and so they're really struggling. And for these reasons, one in four. Um, refugee uh, students in America actually drop out of school. So what I decided to do was to link up playing sports and education. So pretty much we call our kids uh, scholar athletes. and We try to have them um, be really excited about learning. Um, this picture that I have right here is uh, a group of our high school um, players. And uh, they got to take classes at UCSD. They're, they're making a solar oven right here. It's a smart solar oven that they put together. Um, and it, you know, they, they configured it to, to actually follow the sun. And they actually built mechanical um, remote control cars and a lot of great things. So uh, here the kids are right here working on their projects again. And um, so it's really exciting. I had a couple other pictures on here that I couldn't show you guys. Um, but there's one story that I would really like to share um, of a young man from Afghanistan that um, his father died about five years ago when he was in Iran as a refugee. And the Iranian government has a policy where Afghan refugees are not allowed to go to school. So this, this kid literally spent his entire life walking two hours to work every day and washing dishes for 10 plus hours, two hours on the way back. And um, a year and a half ago, uh, going on two years now, he moved to the United States and has been in our program ever since. Um, and we just had a standing round of applause for him the other day in our education program because he got a 3.8 GPA. Um, and the kid never got any formal education in his life. Um, 
so it's a, it's a really exciting um, moment of what we're doing with the kids. Um, I'm not sure if these are all the slides right here. Another thing that we're doing um, that's really exciting is um, is a leadership program that we're doing. We really wanted uh, the community to lead themselves, not just an outsider coming in to showing them what to do. We really wanted them to be the ones um, at the forefront of what we're doing. Um, so I, I think I'm going to show a video here, and uh, yeah. Touch, touch, touch. Very good, Aisha. Not touches. Leave it. Our leadership program is the thing that I'm most proud of. There are the high school age kids who exhibit the most potential for leadership. So we train them how to be coaches. Okay, we're going to pass to each other, okay? As soon as you get it, start passing again. Get it back in your position, okay? Go, yeah. I love these kids, and it's fun to be a leader. Like, they all look up to you, they just want to learn something from you. Both feet, keep your feet moving. Good job, good job, good pass, Nadine, good job. I've been through the same thing and nobody lead me, like, so I just want to help them out. They come out here three days a week, helping coach. They come out on Sundays in the morning at 7 o'clock to set up the fields. And they're giving the younger refugee kids what they never had. They're giving them a childhood. It's amazing what they do. I want it to be like the way that Coach Mark act with the soccer players. I am doing it for the kids because... I like them to be like great soccer players on the future. Okay, yes on me. Yes on three. One, two, three. Yes! Good job, guys. When we tell the older kids, they look up to you more than they look up to us because they watch you play in score goals. So when they feel that, their behavior changes. So it's really powerful. This is actually the young man, Sadiq, that I talked about earlier. Um, who was a refugee his whole life in Adan and actually got to get the 3.8 GPA. So I'm hit, hitting the books really hard right here, so I just wanted to make sure you guys got to see him, which was really great. This is actually a picture of our leadership program, looking pretty sharp right here. Um, all the youth leaders are the ones in black, and, uh, and, the, and the staff is wearing white right there. Um, so pretty much like you saw in the video, we train all these kids how to be coaches. We take them up on leadership camps. Um, we give them their first jobs. They actually get paid stipends for what they do. And um, it, it's a really exciting uh, thing that they, that they get to do. Um, this is uh, Ahmed here on the left. He was actually in the video as well. And I like to talk about him uh, in, our, in our struggle to get field space um, when people were really threatened by uh, what we were trying to do in our, in our community. Um, this young man came to speak about his life story. <clears throat> he got cancer right in the uh, height of the war in Iraq and he couldn't get treatment, so he had to go back and forth between Jordan and his home country in, in uh, Iraq. Um, and he finally, uh, he didn't get a chance to play soccer in Jordan or when he came to the United States until he found out about our program. He's not really the, the most gifted athlete in the world. Um, he's a pretty small guy. He, because of his cancer, he didn't have a chance to really mature physically. But he comes up to me in my education program, he says, Coach, look, I'm, I'm not gonna even talk about soccer. I just wanna come here and come to education, and if you feel like you can give me a chance to play on the soccer team, I'd be really grateful. So I said, okay, just show up for a month and don't talk to me about soccer. <clears throat> because all the kids, they don't care about education at first. They wanna, they wanna play sports, they wanna win those cups. And so he came for a whole month, didn't ask me about anything, and uh, I did give him a chance to try out, and he was on the soccer team. A couple games ago, actually, he scored a goal, and I was like going crazy. And so he's a pretty good player, and uh, he went up in front of the council, and he told them about his life story, and, it, and this being his dream. And, um, and so right now, he's playing for our club, he's coaching in the leadership program, and um, he's really, really trying to get into college. And actually, December 8th, him and I are going to do a TEDx talk together in San Diego, because I told him it's going to help him get into college, and so he, he signed up for it right away. So these kids are really, really motivated, and they're seeing that, you know, um, Doing good in school really is pretty cool, you know. And uh, for his for his work in the community, he actually got recognized and threw the first pitch at the San Diego Padres game, which um, I was really excited about. I was there. I was so nervous for him. Um, like his dad sitting there watching, hope he didn't mess up. He threw a great pitch. Um, they don't play baseball in Iraq. So I took him out after soccer practice and we pitched the balls around. Um, he did a great job, but the fryer actually for the Padres dropped the ball which was a bummer, but, but he's doing okay now. Um, when I graduated college, um, the commencement speaker um, 
talked about his, his story that really moved me. Um, one day he was driving on the freeway and he got pulled over by a cop um, for something that he didn't do. And uh, a moment later he got um, an on buying, an on, uh, a car hit him in the back and uh, he was not able to move and the car caught flames very quickly. And there was hundreds of cars driving past him and it was really obvious that he needed help. And he thought he was going to take his last breath when uh, out of nowhere a man came in and took him out of the car right before it exploded. And uh, he left me with a question that said, you know, in life, you can be the person driving by or you can be a person who stops and helps when it's obvious that there needs to be something that's done. <clears throat> I kind of feel like that's something that I did. I feel like I did pull over. And um, right now I'm trying to figure things out. And there's a lot of people that pulled over with me. And um, anybody here that's interested in our story or in our kids or wants to help in any way, um, you can come to me and chat and we can talk about ways to get involved. Um, right now we're trying to create a community center and uh, it's our big goal right now. And uh, we're, we're really looking for the future for working with these kids. And I'd like to thank you for your time today, guys. Thank you. Thank you.